Okay, hello insect ecology class. Uh, my name is James Crawl. I'm an assistant professor in the entomology department. And today I'm going to tell you about one of my favorite models of foraging behavior and nutritional ecology in insects, which is uh, the amazing bumblebee. In particular, I want to tell you about uh, their fast and furious approach to rapidly making decisions as they're moving through the natural outdoor environment. And so bumblebees can sometimes have get a little bit of a, of a bad rap. So there's some videos of some bumblebees foraging in a wind tunnel, not always the most graceful. Um, and in fact, during Darwin's time, there were no bumblebees. Bumblebees were called humblebees. Uh, and when they changed, the, the name was eventually changed to bumblebees, there was a great quote uh, from an article describing this change, which I like, which is the clumsy looking furry bee with its pitifully small wings and tubby body was the perfect match for its new, slightly belittling name as it bumbled from droopy bloom to droopy bloom. So I think we often think of bumblebees as these big, sort of heavy, lumbering, oafish creatures of the insect world. But what I want to tell you in part today is uh, about how actually amazing they are as uh, little flying machines. So. This is a pretty um, typical everyday scene we're used to seeing, especially if you're in the insect ecology class. I guess you spend a lot of time uh, outside looking at nature. This is a um, little video from a uh, hillside in the middle of summer in um, Vermont. And I just want to replay that, highlighting something you might not have seen, especially at this resolution the first time, which is a foraging bumblebee out maneuvering through this environment. And so when we move through this environment, it's not particularly challenging, right? Uh, we can walk through the grass, maybe, you know, there's some thistles or something catching our feet, but in general, that's not a hard environment for us. But think about being uh, a bumblebee forager that weighs about 150 milligrams flying through this environment. That is basically like flying through skyscrapers that are moving back and forth uh, that are structurally complex, temporally dynamic because everything's moving, um, and they're maneuvering through this environment um, with all the energy they need for flight kind of on their back. And so they really outperform any, any man-made creature. So this is a, a video sort of slowed down, looking really closely at that moment of a bumblebee flying, in this case through some turbulence to, to get to a fake flower here on the right. And this bee, she's beating her wings 200 times a second, um, she's adjusting the movements of those wings in really subtle ways to maneuver as the, the wind is buffering, buffering her around. They're fueling all that flight again with all the energy on board um, that they need and with about a, several orders of magnitude fewer, fewer neurons than we have in our brains. So they really dramatically outperform any ability to fly through these natural environments that we have or drones have, for example. So they're, they're pretty amazing creatures. And all of that f adaptation to moving through and flying through the environment is really aimed at a pretty simple thing, and that is getting as much food as fast as possible from the environment to fuel themselves and to fuel colony growth. So in particular, what bumblebees and all bees, for the most part, are getting from flowers are two things, nectar, Nectar primarily provides carbohydrates, which we not exclusively, but mostly think uh, fuels adult metabolism. So being a bumblebee is costly, flying is hard, uh, and bumblebees also, like many other social insects, actively incubate the developing brood within the nest so they can heat up their abdomen. And heating up that abdomen, especially in cold environments, can be really costly. Uh, so that uh, takes a lot of metabolic energy. So they need a lot of nectar rich in carbohydrates to fuel that adult metabolism. They're also actively collecting pollen rewards from flowers. In addition to incidentally getting pollen sprinkled on their bodies, um, they're actively collecting pollen and pollen is rich in protein. And that protein, for the most part, there's some adult metabolism and consumption of protein, but for the most part, what it's going toward is coming back to the colony or um, the nest uh, for both social and solitary bees and fueling the growth of new larvae uh, and 
young within the nest. And so this is a look inside of a bumblebee colony in particular. So we're used to seeing foragers out, you know, you're walking around Madison these days, you're seeing sort of the last bouts of foraging activity of foragers out collecting pollen. We're used to seeing foraging outside, but all that is again really aimed at bringing that food back inside the nest and fueling the development of the colony. And in bumblebee colonies in particular, this is kind of a race against time. So whereas honeybee colonies last many years and they overwinter with tens of thousands of workers, bumblebee colonies are sort of like an annual plant. So they start in the spring with a single queen um, who will go out. So early in spring here in Wisconsin, you'll see uh, single large bees out, especially in the earliest days of flowering in the spring. Uh, and those are single solitary queens that don't have any workers yet that are going out and gathering their own resources from um, flowers, bringing those back to the nest, and incubating, developing eggs that they've laid, and provisioning them. Once those eggs develop into new workers, those workers will grow and start taking on some of that colony labor, um, and so the queen will start staying in the nest. So you don't see the queens, even though they're still around, you don't see them in midsummer because that now the foragers, the new workers, have, have taken over um, that, that activity and foraging work. But so the whole colony is trying to grow very rapidly over the course of often just a, a couple months in summer during this sort of nice window, especially in temperate regions, of good growing conditions. And then at the end of the season, they send out reproductives um, and new males and queens, and they disperse out from the colony, mate, all the males and all the workers die and then the queen restarts. So it's a cool life cycle, but one of the consequences of that is that there's real pressure to grow very quickly. And so bees are constantly trying to find food as sort of fast as possible. So one example of this is this interesting observation that sometimes when you see bumblebees forage on flowers, uh, they won't drink all the nectar in it, right? So you kind of think, oh, if you're desperate for food, you're spending all this energy and time trying to find good resources, why would you leave nectar once you've found a, a flowering plant, right? Well, so there's an interesting explanation for that. And it has to do with the fact that bees are not maximizing necessarily the total amount of food they want to bring in, but they're really maximizing the rate per time at which they want to collect food. So, Here's an example from an older study um, where on this graph you're looking at on the x-axis how much nectar a flower has and on the y-axis uh, how much time it takes to consume that nectar. So what you want to notice here is that if you that it's not a straight line, right? So that line is kind of flattening out so it's uh, not exactly the same. If there's a straight line you would say that, oh, the amount of nectar per time for all these flowers is the same. But actually, if you look at for here over on the right side in green, notice, or noted kind of a full flower, you're getting about six microliters in three seconds, right, from that full flower. But on the other end, on the left, a flower that only has, say, one microliter in it, that takes a second. So you get one microliter of nectar per second on that flower. So your rate of intake is faster when flowers are full. Bringing in uh, food faster when the food vessel is more full kind of makes sense, right? Imagine uh, eating yogurt out of a, a plastic container, right? The beginning, the first few bites are nice, full, easy to get food out, and then you're toward the end because you're getting hungry, and now you're really scraping the last little bits out. You can imagine that that is slower, right? And if you had a bunch of those in a row and you were really trying to eat as fast as possible, you might not worry about getting the last little little bits of each, um, the, the bottom of each container, right? So this is basically what flowers are doing, or what bees are doing. And it turns out that has to do with, and whether or not they exhibit that behavior depends on how much food is out in the environment. So when food is plentiful and nectar is abundant in flowers, they will leave nectar in because they can expect that the next flower they go to 
is full and therefore their rate of intake is faster and it's worth the time sort of switching flowers to get to that that more abundant fast intake rate flower but if overall nectar is not abundant and so their rate of intake of the next flower is going to be low then it's worth the time to stay on the flower and sort of finish the last bite uh, and so basically in abundant environments with lots of nectar bees will leave nectar there but when conditions are rough or there's not as much food around bees will totally empty flowers so it sort of relates to this ecological interesting ecological pattern and so that just sort of highlights that be, what bees really care about is the rate at which they're taking in food they want to make all they're uh, going from flower to flower, flower spending seconds there you know hundreds thousands of times each day and so there's a premium on making really fast decisions and so a lot of their foraging behavior reflects adaptations um, to that end to try to forage as quickly and as efficiently as possible so one of my favorite examples of those kinds of adaptations are that bumblebees can actually sense electric fields so bumblebees like us or any living organism have a small electric charge in their body and it turns out when they land on a flower they transfer some of that electric charge to the flower and so this is the diagram on the left you're looking at here this is the uh, electric potential in a flower stem as a bee visits so it charges up and then slowly decays over time as the bee leaves and so it turns out bees can learn the sort of shape and intensity of those electric fields when they're making decisions on what flowers to visit so the theory on why we think this is useful for bumblebees in their natural environments is uh, whether or not a flower has an electric charge might tell you whether or not a bee just visited that flower. So it's a great fast piece of information that without him having, having to land on a flower can tell you whether or not something might have been visited. So in this sort of rapid decision making world, it's a key piece of information. So. One example of foraging behavior you might know about is from the, the social honeybees. So honeybees live in large colonies with tens of thousands of individuals and they exhibit one of the most remarkable behaviors in the animal kingdom. And this is the waggle dance. So this is a video of uh, a forager that has found some food and has come back to the honeybee colony and through uh, the intensity and duration and angle of the the, her dance on the honeycomb, she's telling other foragers in the colony the direction and distance to food sources as well as the quality of those food sources. So that's an amazing and remarkable behavior. Bumblebees are closely related to honeybees but sort of have a somewhat simpler social system. So instead of tens of thousands of workers in a the colony, they have a few dozen up to a, a few hundred usually. But it turns out they still have some kinds of important social information transfer within colonies. So one of my favorite examples of this is the ability to learn and transfer strange and unnatural behaviors within a colony. So for example, here you're seeing a sort of diagram of uh, bumblebees being trained to essentially pull on a string of a food resource and pull it out from under a, a, essentially a table that they can't get under. A very unnatural behavior. So A, it's cool that bees can learn that behavior. It tells you about their sort of flexibility and uh, kind of amazing learning ability. But also one of the most remarkable things is if, uh, and this is a diagram down here, if you isolate a bee in a container next to, uh, in a spot where she can watch a nest mate, who has learned that strange behavior over a long time, um, perform that behavior, that bee that got to watch her nest mate solve that problem will be much faster, even though she's never done it herself. She learns by watching and sort of paying attention to what her nest mate is, is doing. And this doesn't work if you know it's a human or some other um, way of manipulating that. It's really specific to paying attention to the motor patterns of fellow bumblebees and what they're doing and then uh, yeah these bees can can learn this so not only can they learn strange behaviors but they can socially 
and sort of culturally transmit those behaviors to other bees with a colony. And finally, I just want to tell you about one of my another sort of amazing example of clever bumblebee behavior. So one thing that happens is sometimes for whatever reason there's not enough flowers or food in the environment around you, right? Uh, and so you might think that bees just say, well, we had a good run, there's no food, you know, better luck next year or to someone else that survives. But turns out they can actually take an active role in producing food. So here what you're looking at in these diagrams is uh, on the left side, this is a picture of a bumblebee biting and inflicting mechanical damage on a plant that is not flowering. And on the right, where you're seeing your graph showing that that actually induces flowering faster than um, if just then controls that don't have any mechanical damage or manipulation. So it turns out the bees are able to induce plants to produce food for them faster when they're hungry and there's no food in the environment. So that just gives you some examples of uh, the amazing behavioral world of foraging and bumblebees and that they're not just these sort of tubby, droopy, slow-moving creatures. They're really remarkable, very sort of fast-paced, uh, amazing animals, and I'm looking forward to, in our activity this week, uh, seeing some of that firsthand.